एवरीवन वी आर इशिका एंड अक्षय फ्रॉम द थिंग अबाउट वाइल्ड लाइफ वी आर पार्टनरिंग विद द बायोडायवर्सिटी कोलैबोरेटिव टू ब्रिंग टू यू अ थ्री पार्ट सीरीज अराउंड बायोडायवर्सिटी सोसाइटी एंड सस्टेनेबल डेवलपमेंट इन द अंडमान एंड निकोबार आइलैंड्स Human well-being is inextricably linked with nature. The Biodiversity Collaborative is a nationwide effort to remind every Indian of this fact and bring biodiversity back into the center of each of our lives. This initiative was catalyzed and supported by the Office of the Principal Scientific Advisor to the Government of India and is currently being supported by Rohini Nilakani Philanthropies. This is the second episode in our three-part series on the Andaman and Nicobar Islands, humanity and restoration. This idyllic concept of people's oneness with nature often hides multiple layers of tension beneath. In today's episode we will hear about the shifting rules of access to nature in the Andaman and Nicobar Islands the aftermath of the 2004 tsunami on human nature relationships and also the ethics of working in the islands for example how should researchers extract data what should policy analysts prescribe and how should respect constrain what we as outsiders give and take from people and nature Our guest for this episode is Manish Chandy, an affiliate with the Andaman and Nicobar Environment Team and Nature Conservation Foundation. In the last 25 years, Manish has worked on a wide range of projects in the region: herpetological surveys, forest restoration, and anthropology. For his PhD, he lived with the Nicobari people, studying community sharing mechanisms and how they were disrupted by the 2004 tsunami. Manish Chandy continues where we left off in episode one. Through his stories he demonstrates the various ways in which lives of people in the islands are intertwined with nature. Manish also illustrates how restoration of natural habitats can never be one dimensional in its outcome. Manish's insights are interspersed throughout this conversation by his inimitable tales gathered from decades of lived experience working in these islands. So let's jump right in. Hey Manish, it's wonderful to have you back with us to share more stories. Hi, both of you, Ishika and uh, Akshay. In our last episode with Madhuri, Shiba, and yourself, we spoke about why the islands are special, what set them apart from mainland in India, and we touched upon their ever-changing nature. We also spoke a little about the devastating tsunami of 2004, which simultaneously showed us how vulnerable and yet resilient the people and nature of the islands are. We want to have a more free-flowing conversation today about the 25 plus years that you've spent across the archipelagos and what you've learned in that time. Historically, the islands have seen so many outsiders come in for different mm. purposes. You know, whether it was uh, the Britishers, whether it was other uh, colonizers, whether it was, uh, or even now, people like you and me uh, are going in as outsiders, but with the research interest. And now there is, of course, as the years are going by, different groups of people are gaining so much more interest in the islands for different purposes. It may be for research. It may be for conservation. it may be just for documentation perhaps there are anthropologists perhaps okay. uh, you know there are people coming in to develop the islands if there could be government initiatives but there has also been such a cruel history when you think about it mm. culturally for a lot of the indigenous communities there and there is also this very um, anglicized white lens which is put over the island you know looking at it as a case study uh, right. looking at it as something that is alien or far removed from the norm or natural that is something that of course has to change that sensitivity needs to come in so right. 
now that you've you know also been there for so long worked with various different communities across that entire stretch what do you think are very clear ethical uh, considerations or points for anybody who goes to that island for whatever purpose what is a good way to approach this area you know when you look at it and either uh, for the work that somebody wants to do or even just to learn about the place what is a good way to go about that which is ethical and sensitive to the local culture weather and biodiversity both put together what first comes to my mind is is something that uh, ravi shankaran friend of mine he had kind of instilled in me many many years ago saying man when you go there first of all shave your beard which i didn't because he said all the nikobari ladies are going to look at you and get scared and kind of run away from there because you will never be able to any work he used to tell me that <laughs> i never did but the second thing he told me was and still stands true today take permission when you go there first of all when you first get a, get into a village go meet the captain go meet the elders of the to het or, or which your group it is there speak to them tell them what you come come there it is their village it is their space and you are you are entering it there for a short point of time go take permission and i was very fortunate in fact to uh, take a photograph in little nikobar of uh, a board which is written in english it's painted in english saying if you are entered here please take permission from simon first captain and it it, 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 it exactly spells out um, that it says very clearly that to and it is a, it is a practice that a lot of us in the past of the in the past used to follow of going and meeting the first captain telling them about um, the work and not taking sides it's another very very important uh, uh, aspect of field work or of research because people do tend to pull you on there there are politics at play there are local issues at stake sometimes and very often uh, i've known of researchers taking sides and especially when uh, they get pulled into local politics or local uh, uh, issues which one can't avoid it at very many points of time but you can still avoid it by not be, by being a fence sitter as well saying this is something i can't really kind of put my fingers into i can hear you and listen to you and be with you but i will i won't probably be able to speak on your behalf that's something you have to do on your own because i don't belong here and it's not my right to do so and even though you may want me to do so and that's a, it's a call that a research has to take of even trying to i know of people kind of boost a person's image of saying yeah this is this person is such a great guy and that guy and so on and so forth and so on and so forth one has to be careful about those aspects of uh, of being in, in in that sense being ethically kind of clear of a clear conscience of uh, not taking advantage is the other thing and i was taught again this by some ladies in little nikoba of when i went there first first as a, as a researcher i was there to look at turtles but i was going through these old houses stopping by beach by beach going from house to house and i saw these beautifully carved uh, carvings in their houses carvings in their houses of people of amalgamations of people and animals very animistic kind of uh, beings i didn't know what they were so i asked them what they said they call kareyu what are kareyu kareyu are basically beings which are represent are represented through a shaman's uh, uh, image or through a shaman through a shamanic kind of procedure uh, and they don't even call use the word shaman there, there is a term for them a kasuan or a minloon the shaman is an english or an english uh, term or, or a term from uh, another place which is used in english but for them it is kamas kasuan or or a, or a minloon a person has an intermediary between the spirit world and the human world who has given a design to these people to represent uh, either a, a being or a spirit or even an ancestor and here i was wanting to photograph those um, curiosities uh, that were there in front of me and this lady of the house who actually became her, her son became a very good friend of mine um she point blankly said no get this fellow out of the house i don't want him here i actually had to go out so i i mean i didn't take a picture but i was asked, i was asking about for it she in her own language told the guys i was with saying take this guy out i don't want him here that taught me a great lesson to first of all i mean firstly i was asking permission i asked but i i also had to respect the fact that i can't i can't take it and i didn't for an entire year believe me i never took a picture of a single kareyu despite the urge of taking my camera quietly and going click just one click and getting a shot i just didn't and that gave me and that gave the people some respect to to me as well and eventually they said yes you can go ahead and do that you can take pick take a couple of pictures but don't use your flash because it it can it can, it can frighten the spirits and so on 
once i did use my flash accidentally or whatever it was, it was too dark the next day i was told that in their dream the person's dream the there was thunder and uh, lightning and there was a huge amounts of rain his mother came in his dream she cried and so on and so forth don't use your flash again so these instances of i mean these experiences in field work taught me that one has to i mean I, what a however kind of great we may think of our own conscious of i mean how much ever we may know one has to respect local rules and regulations and kind of uh, emotions as much as possible it helps a great deal because i mean i know i have complete trust of those people and similarly vice versa i can leave my thing that kind of if i'm trying to leave my son with some of them at some point of time and that or that that level of trust comes by being able to be trustworthy and that's important even if you're there for a short period of short period of time there are people who are going to come after you who are going to do similar work and one has to be at in their best behavior as much as possible and um, that's one one aspect the other in terms of designing or thinking of projects or of or of concepts or work um there are various questions in ecology that one can kind of or or in social science that one can kind of uh, question and and raise to understand how our world functions and um uh, how it kind of how local communities or even species are being able to deal with uh, those issues that are bothering us in our head i think it is important of course to do that to be able to think in on those lines to be able to uh and being able to 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 be able to conceive of such uh, ideas or 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 issues to kind of consider as problems to understand uh, is is a very important part of being uh, being a researcher and kind of thinking things through you may not always necessarily be able to apply it uh, or find a means of being able to apply it to help a local community or a local people that you're associated with or uh, or in the vicinity if it is possible of course go ahead and see if it's if it's going to be of any use to them as well because that's how, that's how that that is what the scientific progress right of being able to use use it to benefit both as a both as a theoretical kind of paradigm or even otherwise as a as a pragmatic or a practically a practical way of applying um, knowledge gained and um it's also important to think out of the box and by and by th- we all trying to we may want to think out of the box but we we have a lot of conventions that are there at stake as well and it's good to know them what those conventions and biases etc are but also to to spend, go spend some uh, you know in a few week, a week or two if, if it's possible to get a grip of the local situation and see where your uh, ideas or your thoughts are can how they can be applied in this and that in that particular landscape and then thereby take uh, kind of always kind of always assess uh, what is it, what is important is to always keep assessing where you have reached and what you what you're doing um and that i think is both ethically and a a, a good practice as a, as a as a scientist whether you're a, a, a scientist of the uh, of life life sciences or not whatever it is being in a, in a different space to be all, always constantly reassess where you have reached what you're doing with the local with the, the local community with the subject of your interest and so on and take it from there thanks for that manish uh, it's incredibly important to keep reorienting ourselves and uh, it was really helpful to get some of that insight especially through examples of you know how you can be more ethical citizens in vulnerable landscapes anywhere uh, including the andaman and nicobars I think it's particularly interesting given the context of everything we discussed in episode 1 as well. For those listening in and who haven't heard episode 1, we highly recommend going back to that episode to find out what's so unique about the islands in comparison to the rest of India and also why we spent the last 10 minutes discussing the importance of ethics. Manish, one thing you know that I wanted to uh, just reflect on as you were talking especially with the previous question was just how suspended in time in many aspects and you know for our conversation of course in terms of development and infrastructure it feels like so little has changed over the years in these spaces because while you were talking about what you noticed the first time you landed in great nicobar 25 years ago and the kind of mm. infrastructure you saw there the kind of medical facilities that were there what the bunk was like in the ship you know all of that matches identically my experience from having gone there just about 4 to 5 years ago and 
I also remember having a conversation with you before I left for Great Nicobar and you told me, have a great time, learn as much as you can from the community, but the only rule is don't fall sick because there's no medical help for you there. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you fall sick, you're going to have to come all the way back to the Andamans or we're going to have to send you to the mainland to take care of your health. You know, I went there thinking this is clearly good advice, but it can't possibly be that bad. But it was, you know, unless I had only a common cold, anything more than that, it would actually be quite that risky to fall sick. No, yeah. Uh, so yeah, you're, you're bang on correct. I mean, I completely am in, I'm in, I'm in agreement with what you observed and experienced and saw, which is why I was stating that, that look, even though 25, for me, 25 years has gone by and so on, or for a settler or person who's living there has been many, many, a, a generation has gone by. For many many cases, I remember. I mean, this brings back a, a visual to me of a man called Theodore, uh, who was a painter. He used to live in 35 kilometer at Shastrinagar in uh, Great Nicobar. And I'd seen him way back many years ago when he was actually painting, doing some paintings for the uh, assistant, assistant commissioner's office, large mural like things of uh, life in the island and so on. He was a much younger man then, and very cheerful, old ex-army military person, whatever he was and uh, settled in Shastrinagar. Fast forward to post-tsunami, 2005, and I see him as an old man, barely able to walk, and shaking, shaking all over, standing board a ship uh, to Port Blair for some medical treatment because the medical facility at Great Nicobar had nothing. And he had to jump, across, we had to help him across a, a couple of planks between the two jetties which was broken, a uh, couple of planks of wood, imagine. And then jump onto a pontoon that was kind of waving like nobody's business and going up and down to the sea waves. Held, held him and take him to the ship which is lying offshore because Harshavadan couldn't come next to the and berth at the, at the jetty. Rocking and rolling, this elderly man with no teeth who was contributed and kind of being so to Great Nicobar, life in Great Nicobar. People know him, his, his art is there. And we was using him as an example. A man in his old age, in his prime, kind of a much beyond his prime, kind of being uh, subject to a lot of a lot of difficulty and it felt so sad to see him going like this. Uh, so Theodore was this man uh, who had kind of suffered um, and he eventually passed on. So they, and I'm using his, using his name and his story or what is there in my, in my, uh, my memory of someone who, I mean, people who have lived there, they have actually, very many of them have suffered and I do continue to suffer in very many ways. In this day and age, when we have 75,000 crores to throw around for uh, whatever it is, uh, whatever it may be, why can't we use that same money to kind of provide these basic facilities for people you have settled or the government of India has settled in these areas, uh, whether be they in Great Nicobar, in Campbell Bay, Shastri Nagar, or even in Port Blair for that matter, for some much more improvised ways of being able to live in the present day and age. And we all know India has all the tech, all the facilities that are required and possible. We have it. Not being is not being kind of put to the best use. That's all it is. And for and especially for people like this, there are people who are there who are uh, infirm, who who require treatment and so on and so forth, who have to be airlifted out of uh, Great Nicobar to Port Blair uh, or anywhere else and so on. We need to be able. It's it's so important for us to be able to ensure that uh, uh, these are available for those local communities. So that's my my main grouse. I mean, there is there is even education. There is a I have a picture, uh, a photograph I took after the tsunami of these young boys from Little Nicobar whom I knew as young kids. Now the young young men probably, and uh, playing around in a rubble or a mound of books. They were because the post tsunami uh, immediate shelter was the veranda of the local school in Great Nicobar. I also was living with them, I was sleeping on the same veranda for a while. The bathroom was an open air toilet at the back and so on. And these kids who had never even seen a school ever in their life were just playing around with paper and uh, books thrown out of from the school over there. And amidst all, among all of that was this young guy who was younger then. Obviously, he's a married man with two children now. They're called Madan. His actual name is Gershom. His local name is Madan. He told me he wanted to go to school. He must have been all of about uh, 19, 18, 19, around that time, in 2005, or around somewhere around there, his age. He said, Manish, I want to go to school. I said, Kyo yaar, what's happened? What's up? He said, No, I've never been to school. I want to be able to read and write. 
it's very touching because this somebody who's been uh, who was he was living away his his household was on on the west coast where i was staying in his i was staying in his house his mother's house there was no school or anything on that side if he had to attend school he had to go to pilamilo or to pulo panja on the on the eastern uh, north but that didn't happen but here he was saying i missed an opportunity for many years uh, i've only heard about school i know what a school is all about but i've never experienced it i want to kind of experience it. he actually went and sat down with his children eventually he he we went to he he i took him to the uh, principal then and the, uh, the teacher i said this guy is really keen matlab aap madad kar sakte hai said ha he can come and just it is post tsunami time hai. so every, everything was possible at that point of time it is all kind of uh, hey bhai so madan as a young man sat down with uh, uh, class 1 students to learn abc and what not he sat down for maybe a week or so i think <laughs> just to experience it and eventually had to come back because he had other work to do but he actually went and sat down in school so uh and it 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 was it was it, it hit me in my head like here i am i'm an educated guy i mean i'm supposedly educated i'm, I'm coming out to do some research and i'm talking all high funda stuff or thinking of tired of of all kinds of things in my head and here are guys who actually, who i ran away from academics at, at one point of time and here is a guy who actually wanted to go and see what it is all about and he he eventually got to uh, see it now he has two children he's back in the jungle living in the corner of great nikobar i don't actually on top northern northern top i don't know if his children are going to school but uh, that is the situation like it, it 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 goes back so in very many ways goes back the, the cycle the, the cycle is not it hasn't been broken this the circle is a never ending kind of world uh, it's like a wall it goes round and round and round, round. nothing actually really kind of uh, taking shape and that's the sad part mm-hmm. and uh, despite so many years uh, bringing about change when they have invested in money in building schools or medical facility in pillo panja and 2022 i last month in january i hear from the the captain that the that the the phc has been shut down uh, school has been shut down where where are we heading what are we what are they trying to do of course it is covid time and so on and so forth but it is it is eminently possible we have the web authority of of testing a teacher and kind of sending him or her out or there into those places the that's the, that that is another issue which i'm sure you some of you may be aware of that uh, especially in these areas talk about more my focus is more on the nikobas uh, at least the southern nikobas in particular and other parts as well there's a first of all there's a huge cultural uh, gap between the mainlander origin teachers who are there in port blair who were sent out on posting to the nikobar islands uh, for a year or more or a few months if at all it's it is considered a punishment posting because they sent out into the areas where they they can't get dal sabzi and uh, it living is a very different way of life is completely most people try and avoid it as much as they can they keep taking leave uh, uh, whatever leave is possible and bunk class as much as for the teachers and come back to popular and hang out or, or disappear for some time and come back and kind of show their attendance and so on it's so sad because then you have there are an entire population of uh, and generations of people who are being denied uh, education when it actually the infrastructure for it is actually been been uh, put in place and it is so sad to see actually i've seen it i mean i've complained about it to on very many instances of uh, post tsunami schools being built there's creepers all over it and there's kachara all around it a, lo- a tree a branch has fallen through the roof and gone into the classroom no one is it's, it is it is it is revived and kind of spruced up before the secretary education came up came came about it happens then not for the students to live in or to uh, work in and then talking about isolated instances this is not a uh, this is not common place across but these are isolated instances just re- uh, reflective of and uh, describing the extremes that happen in these places on the other hand you have uh, an island like say chaura which has uh, a full fledged primary or secondary school of am right now and uh, very well built a lot of the teachers are from within the island itself there's a couple of teachers from within the island who are all educated pgt teachers or uh, graduate graduate trained teachers or even a post graduate post graduate uh, trained teachers who are posted in chaura and they like it because they're at home they're not posted in uh, digipur or wherever else it's, it's exactly the same for them as well when they are pushed out of their own uh, comfort zone into the andamans like a, a teacher from the andamans is being pushed onto the nikobar it's considered a punishment posting these guys don't don't necessarily see it as a punishment posting it's a way of being able to see the other parts of the andamans it is ha mauka mila wahan jaane ke liye i've been able to stay and spend ek saal do saal teen saal wahan par matlab posting kar mera 
they come back but uh, the chaura and kanikubar and to certain extent even kamota is is fairly well uh, structured and you have a system in place which is functioning schools are functional and uh, functioning it's the more remote lo- lo- localities which suffer these uh, inadequacies and i think that's where our efforts should ideally be pushed into being able to improvise and and for teachers to be able to stay in these places so even though chaura has it for a teacher to come and stay there, i've met many teachers who have come in mainland which is who who are staying in a guest house which doesn't have a cook doesn't have any facilities over there at all they have to cook on their own or find something to kind of there no no vegetables available or whatever they use for different lifestyle there is no fresh water available or not easily available it has to be arranged these are basic amenities which should be kind of catered to and can be catered to if if some thought and effort and investment is uh, put in that direction to make it conducive for people to be able to say yeah i i i am willing to stay there and kind of spend a year or even a few months of hosting these places and that thereby be able to help impart education or provide education to the people who actually really want it and because it creates a huge there's a huge change that one can see and i've seen this i mean i can re- remember a young teacher again thinking or thinking back at chaura he's a post graduate trained teacher called joseph john he belongs to a, a fairly illustrious family in of chaura um and uh, um he is one of the educated sons and he's a teacher there young guy but he has seen it he's seen he's he wasn't enamored by my laptop or and he knows how he has a laptop of his own and uh, uh he sits there and he's doing his own work but you can see this transformation of a person who's being able to who's able to kind of combine or people are able to combine their own traditional lifestyles and culture or what would we refer to as culture and as well as also be adapted and be uh, accepting of a modern world uh, and take what they want from this and take what they want from their own and meld those two it's, it's a beautiful uh, meld that is visible in many parts of the nikobas especially and it's beautiful to see of adaptation and uh, transformation and change taking place on their own terms uh, in very many ways and i think that's the way to go so investment of i mean development of basic infrastructure and basic facilities is of is a, is a, is a real great need dreaming of having employment opportunity for 5 6 lakh people in great nikobar and with a transit and terminal or an airport or a golf course or a spa and so on and so forth in little andaman is obviously some i mean it needs a lot of rethinking and uh, i would junk it so i mean there's no i don't need to use many more words it's just junk it. that's about it it's, it's less said the better actually now i'm really glad you brought up some of these examples you know and also showcase both sides of it and it was so lovely to hear you talk about theodore as well because when i went and uh, was working there i had the opportunity to speak with his son and by the time i was working oh. there uh, theodore had already passed on but his son so right. lovingly and warmly you know show, introduced me to he stood, spoke a lot about his father showed me all of his paintings and of course he's painted a lot of the biodiversity of the island as well and yes, all of these also, yeah. incredible pieces of art are just kind of sitting in his house with his son with uh, you know and just an old folder with collecting fungus and moss and nobody else really gets to see it and it's so beautiful he also showed me some of these um, lovely collage pieces that he's made for you know like for stamps and postcards that the post office could potentially use uh, to okay. depict great nikobar but of course none of it really saw the light of day it, yeah. i now want to pull you back manish into something very personal uh, that you've been involved in uh, with the ecology of the islands you obviously spend some time stepping back and studying and learning the people of about people and nature there but you've also rolled up your sleeves and given and served and this often with a lot of serendipity from what we gather but also never without well thought out intent your restoration work for instance that's something you've worked on a while it's been on the site but also you've seen it through a very unique lens can you share those stories with us could you tell us how you ended up with helping with restoration of forests i had met some guys a man called golok boroy who was then pradhan of um, uh, that village in kalapathur in havelock and they were crocodiles there and we done a survey there and they said ha mat hum log ko patti to nahi hai to ghar banane ke liye there was no road at that point of time which is the epicenter or the most well known tourist hub in the andaman islands as of today 
um i had gone to do some nipa planting uh, there in 98 99 i think so i said look we have already experimented with, experimented with this of planting uh, nipa i had already done that in in i don't know but just just by chance i'd already kind of got a heron interest in this and i went went about doing it i said i can so manish uh, sorry. sorry to interrupt uh, could you could you tell us what nipa is yeah so nipa fruticans is a mangrove palm and uh, it is found in abundance in in parts of the andamans but it was found very abundantly in the nicobar islands it's a it's a beautiful palm it's found along mangrove peaks mostly in southeast asia and um, uh, the andaman nicobar are, are places in india apart from the sundarbans parts of the sundarbans which have uh, this particular palm it looks like a coconut tree but a much larger version of a coconut tree but it doesn't have a, a long tall stem like a coconut tree the fronds are kind of emerge from the ground and the leaves are virtually double the width thickness and size of coconut trees so they've used as as thatching material in the nicobars uh, very much even the karen used to use them when it when it was available uh, in much larger quantity and i don't i don't really exact, exactly remember how i began all this but i just said let's try just try this i mean i found the seed myself on the beach somewhere and i said let's see and i found out what it was and i said let's try and kind of germinate this and see what happens about how if it works out at the station because we had the we i mean at anet in in north wandu there's both freshwater ecosystems i mean a uh, a uh, uh, terrestrial ecosystem as well as a mangrove ecosystem they both there next to each other and so we had the ability of experimenting with both of these uh, forms of vegetation so and it came up it's just that the plants that came up in the at, at the anet station were not as beautiful and as big as they can be can be because there was no real fresh water flowing by it is mostly salt water coming in and going out so the plants are not a lot more stunted in comparison if you look at a nipa grove along a creek which has it was an estuarine creek which has both fresh water and uh, salt water moving in they're really tall really big kritnikuba has some really beautiful examples in further in, in upstream so i took i taken these to havelock some seeds and if you can it would be difficult to believe now but there was a one ship a week to havelock and it used to be the ship called mv ramanujam which is basically a flat bottomed uh, river going vessel uh, which was somehow brought to the andamans for by the administration as a sea going vessel and it used to roll and shake like nobody's business but it it used to be what i i would call a banana boat because it would go with passengers from who are only going to have lock or neel and stop at these two places and on its return journey it would bring back bananas and vegetables because that's that's all the people were doing they were cultivating bananas and vegetables and so that's the only source of income was selling these crop which is very completely kind of infused with the inorganic pesticides and fertilizer and so on so that was their mainstay so uh, sushil dixit was building his small resort which is the first resort on the island called jungle resort um uh, which i think now which, which barefoot is kind of it's called the barefoot uh, resort as of now and there was no place to stay or there was no hotel there was just small your what could uh, chatpati you would get with puri bhaji that kind of stuff so the only places you would get and uh, stuff to eat over there so i'd even taken my bullet on my my bike and i would i would stay there with the golak bora and all for about 3 because no other means of tra- transport so i had my own transportation i could take on the on the ferry come back after 5 days to the next ferry and return back home that all that has changed to having about five boats per or three or four or five boats per day now uh, doing an up and down from havelock and port blaze so you can see the transformation has happened so and it's, it's huge it was from a very kind of nondescript uh, island of course the beaches are beautiful and so on but people living their life just doing agriculture and very few opportunities for them to explore or earn incomes to the present day uh, uh, status of of an island like havelock which is transformed both positively in very many ways and negatively also on on other fronts but these are things that you can see as part of, of a developmental process and uh, havelock is a kind of a microcosm of what it can be for the other islands if it is planned or if it was not planned in the same fashion and so on so those are the experiences and exposures that i was kind of fortunate to have had and um, there is one example of nipa when i used nipa as a tool to kind of go across to uh, a community in havelock much later again it came again into very use very good use even better use in fact because i had had this experience of uh, planting and collecting both both eventually basically establishing a method of collection of the seed uh, which is not difficult at all but it's for in a, in, a, in terms of scale 
when you want to collect it in large numbers, it's not a very easy proposition to kind of consider and think of. But because we had done it with uh, with Agu and uh, Naveen Ekka and so on, I had already done it for a couple of times. We had already established a method of collecting it in in, uh, in in large amounts. It came into very great use when I began a project in, I forget the year, I think it was in 2011 or 12 again with the DST. Of uh, as One of the main features of the project was to restore or regenerate Nipah fruticans in the southern Nicobar as a means of reintroducing the resource which they, was, they were completely dependent on, on for, to build their own houses. And this is a complaint that they had that we don't have houses now with a thatch roof. We really want houses with thatch roofs because the metal roofs are really hot. They make a lot of noise and it isn't a, a roof under which we, we can have our, our traditional or uh, ceremonies and so on. So I said, look, I know where I can get you the seeds and um, I can show you how to kind of go about uh, planting them. It's very easy. And you can reforest your creeks with Nipah all over again. You want to try it? And they said, yeah, of course, let's, let's try it out. So I got the funding eventually from DST and along, they wanted me to add a lot of other components to the project apart from Nipah restoration. But in my mind, it is mostly Nipah restoration, which I was kind of particularly, uh, which is my main, main emphasis. And there again, we would, I mean, in fact, after the tsunami also, because I had the stack of seeds which I collected, we, we, we evolved a, a method called the trap, I call the basket trap method. Essentially putting a sack or even a basket under a culm of uh, the fruit of the nipa, waiting for it to ripen. So the, the, the ecology of the, of the plant is that it, it, the, the, the fruit ripens and the seeds fall off from the uh, plant and they fall directly onto the water, into the creek. And the creek is going either upstream or it's flowing out of the creek back into the sea. So whichever way, the go, whichever way it goes, the seed is getting dispersed. And that's how the plant establishes and disperses itself. It's a very easy, very lovely mechanism that the plant has uh, evolved. We were just arresting it on its, on its way down, preventing its fall into the water, collecting it into a bag. And thereby you can just kind of keep, ba keep uh, bags on, on uh, any number of, n number of uh, trees with seeds, with fruits, and go back every week and check on them to see if they've fallen into the bag or not. And just collect them and take them back home and start planting. And um, so um, that method, that technique as a tool, I'd taken, I'd taken seeds with me to, when I'd gone on this, uh, when we were doing this survey post tsunami in, in uh, southern Nicoba. And the people asked me, Bhaiya, Mata, where can we get this? They call it Raylon. And the word it's in, in little Nicobaris or southern Nicobaris, the word for Nipa, the palm, is Railoy. And a literal translation of that is a leaf, cloth leaf. Rai is leaf. Loi is cloth. Okay. And what is it clothing? It is clothing their houses, giving, giving cloth or a roof to their houses. So that's the, that's the translation, the literal meaning of the word Rai Loi. Rai Loi, it's called also. So, and I could see the need because, I mean, it is a, I mean, all houses, 100% of houses in Little Nicobar, Great Nicobar, originally had uh, thatched roofs, beautifully built houses uh, with varying designs depending on their requirement and the nipa would be harvested, used and it would last them 10 years or even more depending on how, how well smoked the house was with the chula and oh, kitchen running and so on. No need to replace it. Rain, sunshine, um, storm, it will weather it all. So I, it's a beautiful resource, it's a naturally found palm the only way they use it is for thatch. Whereas in other parts, they use it for to collect sap, to make vinegar, to make uh, toddy, to make sugar. Um, the whole range of other byproducts can, can be sourced in the palm. So this is something that you can also see in the islands. And I was also kind of concerned and kind of happy about of seeing how you can tap into these resources in the islands, how people who are actually already tapping into various resources. In the, and it really still interests me. And with the modern, with modernity coming, of course, there's going to be a lot of change that, that will come about. But I said, Chalo, it's, it's a good time to kind of see how we can help them pursue or proceed with what they've already learned and they've already kind of evolved, the systems that are already evolved, rather than introducing something new. So this planting process began uh, before I had the project. And I, I, because I had people coming and asking me, like coming out on a little, I remember this guy called, he's now a young man. He'd come out on a thermocall, a uh, bit of thermocall. He was like using it like a, like a, uh, like a surfboard, sitting on it, paddling himself like that into the while our boat was out uh, off, offshore, out of his village. He came and said, Bhaiya, do you have the seeds? I said, what do you want it for? I said, I want to plant them. He said, go take it, man. And here, I have a bag. Get, get your father, bring your canoe. 
So he gave an entire sack of uh, seeds. Just take it. Go ahead. Go plant it. And they were doing it on their own because they really they, they knew the value of this uh, farm. And I was doing it because I knew I knew that they had value for it. It was a win-win kind of situation. Eventually, when the project came to be, um, I also kind of evolved a method of kind of compensating them for in either in cash or in kind for the planting effort that was being undertaken. I really don't have a real proper, to be honest, I don't, I don't have a proper count of the number of seeds that are eventually germinated, but definitely more than three or 4,000 uh, trees have eventually germinated and kind of come about there. But we were able to revegetate a lot of creeks and I'm sure I haven't gone back, gone back for about five years, six years now, but I'm quite certain that you'll still, if you go back into those creeks, there are going to be uh, uh, creeks with a lot of NEPA. <laughs> and I, in fact, to another aside, I had a call from one of the uh, Intelligence Bureau fellows a couple of days ago, um, asking me if I could kind of share information as to where Burmese hiding places would be in the southern Nicobar. He said there are 10 boats there and we're not being able to find one man. And um, because we hear, hear that you are the guy who has been going about on those creeks, can you tell us? I said, man, we're planted up with Nipah. <laughs> it's going to be difficult for you to find them. <laughs> They're going to be hiding. <laughs> so anyway, the jokes aside, but uh, the fact is that I mean, I've heard back from a lot of the Nikobaris themselves. And uh, in, in one village called Pololo, uh, where the Nipah came back, it's come back beautifully. Uh, there was one man who took it, a guy called Joseph Isler around, who took it upon himself to be the controller of uh, uh, who could harvest it or not. And they have the system. There they already was a, an existing system of being able to regulate harvests. I didn't have to kind of institute that kind of a mechanism. They realized the value of, they know the value of this. Earlier on, it was a virtually an open access resource. It, it virtually was. It still was kind of under some kind of control, uh, especially when it came to being uh, harvested near a village or in a, within a village's kind of pressings. Uh, but it became a very rare and kind of valuable resource after a point of time. And people started taking it upon themselves saying, yes, we have planted it X, Y, Z. We'll have to wait for another five to 10 years for it to establish well, after which we will harvest it. And that makes sense. Rather than kind of jumping the gun and kind of cutting off the leaves and kind of eventually killing the plant, they actually were waiting for it to uh, uh, multiply on its own and establish very well. And that I think is a very good, um, I mean, it's a good take, take home messages for me as well and of learning how people themselves kind of have figured these things out. So, yeah, some of the small things that you've been able to uh, do with something sim as simple as planting a tree or whatever it may be, it could be anything else, even carving a tenu maybe. Uh, these things actually help people in many, many ways that we all really can't describe because the, the ideal, for me, the ideal of, of development is to make people independent, independent of other being of, of rather than kind of making them dependent on a system. And this is something, and to, to kind of share this again with you, uh, when I was uh, made a member of this, uh, the research advisory board for the tribal welfare department, Andaman Nicobar administration, I was there for a couple of many years, actually, with Dr. Vishwajit Pandya, Kanchan Mukhopadhyay, and a couple of others. Uh, one of the things that I would kind of always try and insist on, at least in terms of, of my own philosophy that I'd picked up and kind of uh, evolved through this work that I'd had previously was to, Development but for me was to, was to help people make themselves independent of uh, other sources like government or NGOs. Make them, I mean, they, they should be able to help people stand on their own feet. And that's one thing we were able to even slightly kind of impart to the department, which until then was making people dependent on them. As if you go into the Andaman Nicobar history, they were not doing it particularly with the idea of making them dependent. But it, that, is, that is the way it is going by giving them rice or providing them cloth, cloth clothing. These are articles that they didn't have ready access to, and they had nowhere to source it apart from, apart from the people who are supplying it. That creates a, a, a great sense of dependence. And then you kind of leave eventually once you're caught in between your old, your original culture and your uh, modernity, you're stuck in between and then you're dependent on somebody uh, for all these other goodies that you get from outside. So that's helped in very many other ways as well, apart from what I've personally done in uh, my work. I mean, you've been involved in two very uh, interesting restoration projects that began with the motivation of not being restoration at all, right? It began with a, uh, your first restoration effort was um, reforesting a field station with native mm -hmm. trees, which was, and with the primary goal being protection of water as well as, say, uh, aesthetic beauty. And the second mm -hmm. was the Nipah plantation, which you started off, I guess, previously as well, but then 
primarily through for the post tsunami restoration as well right yeah. so yeah. this is a very very different motivation from what you hear uh, a lot of people talking about restoration because they start off with biodiversity and then they mm -hmm. add on these human aspects but in yours the 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 human need for these forests is is uh, essential in fact biodiversity is is in fact ancillary to that it's clearly what you present is something that is in some sense more just and more is what is what is needed in terms of restoration globally and now everybody's talking about restoration it's, it's now a buzzword but your direction of approach is actually a minority why is that and what are what are some of the lessons and when you talk to people who are more of the you know they with ecology first kind of restoration practitioners how do you uh, bring your bring this perspective to them uh, i never really saw it in that way but you put it quite right even in looking back yeah because truly and fairly enough i didn't look at it only or clearly with a, only a, a, an ecological restoration uh, form of lens even that even saying or referring to it as an ecological restoration is untrue because uh, in the larger scheme of things the ecology refers to all the beings that are there alongside it what we were trying to do were like two different situations of like you said rightly pointed in, in wandur and in uh, little nikoba and both were actually for human needs more than anything else and uh, alongside that like you said you use you use the word ancillary uh, correctly because what happens is once you, you I mean, what we were doing is one was mostly a monoculture the, the, the not a monoculture but nipa it was found as a very dominant uh, and is found as a dominant uh, vegetation in most parts of the nikobas in the creeks and you can see i mean first of all it is already only the the the, the uh, stream banks had been kind of washed off with nipa the rest of the forest was still there. so while i was planting you could hear monkey calls you could hear uh, I mean, macaque calling birds left right center all all over the occasional popping of a shrimp from its or even a crab from its and its hole and so on they were all there the species of the, the diversity and the the uh, nature was all it's all the all we were trying to do was ensure that a, a species or a resource that was primary uh, uh, originally uh, very easily available was available back again and what gave me kind of also looking back and saying what gave me kind of uh, a push was also seeing small little crabs in, in in stands where there already were like the remaining nipa was there like a couple of places there crabs hanging out of the edges and stuff like that. but on on other banks you wouldn't see that that life because the substrate was just a plain muddy substrate there wasn't any vegetation on it apart from grass if at all and in wandur like you said uh, there were those those are, there was a, a a land which had been uh, Uh, deforested to kind of grow supari which never actually took place we did this thing of planting trees back and as a benefit in fact on the second year itself we started seeing birds coming and perching on those small saplings and become about 3 feet or 4 or 4 feet high i mean they were just passing through but they would stop over and while they were go going going about passing across they were shitting as well and they were bringing seed of other uh, uh, trees from around or other species of whatever so in, in the fifth or sixth year we started planting lianas and uh, cane and bamboo and stuff like that but that only the the process had only begun with the tree with the birds bringing in seed we just kind of enhanced that uh, process but the yeah so to come back to what you know was the push that kind of i was what i can see as a push in many ways was it was just that, that we were doing it for our own benefit and and as, as human beings i was i was involved in the process of saying yeah i think this place i mean what if i reflect the place needed some it needed effort we needed to kind of put an effort to plant uh, those trees so um, what i'm trying to say is that uh, yes the 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 primary focus was catering to a human need of uh, of doing of putting in these uh forms of vegetation in in for for a range of reasons the reasons are immaterial actually the the, the primary focus is we uh, as humans wanted to kind of do this but the uh, it's talking only about trees it could be about restoration of even handicraft it could be restoration of uh, a lifestyle of certain aspects of a lifestyle it could be and those i mean it could, it could be a range of other uh, things trying to restore a particular activity or i don't know way of life maybe i mean i'm trying to kind of broaden my thought process it isn't happening but i'm trying to kind of give a much more broader perspective of saying look 
one has to i think it's important to look at it from a more uh, as a, as holistically a process as possible and for that one and it, because it's a it is a learning process i never i never knew all, all of this when i was began doing it actually it uh, a lot of it came uh, flowed in quite quite well because i i mean i was i mean the first thing i think i think the most important thing is being open to ideas and rather than kind of pushing down one idea or the other um uh, like even with the nipa even with the uh, in lichnikabar like i told you about the other aspects of the of, of trying to kind of convert toddy into syrup and vinegar and so on and so forth i failed and being happy with failure i think is also very important or learning from it saying yeah it's not possible so i'm going to be positive i can't push something down somebody's throat on the other hand having to deal with the range of other people also is also important equally important one of my colleagues and a very good friend uh, who's still alive the 90 year old man 90 plus old old year old man uncle pao he was my uh, both friend and guru when we when we started the planting at at anak i don't know if i told you about this earlier on but uh, if you look from the kitchen towards the boys the crew hut there are a couple of uh, terminalia or badam trees i think yeah terminal trees procedure which i actually planted in a line do the trees that he actually physically planted and he was insistent that if you're going to be planting or trying to kind of uh, grow trees on this land you have to plant them in a line and so the forest department does it they have these lines and you count count them by lines and here i was telling no no uncle don't plant it in a line we want to make it in the wild jungle make it as wild as possible you don't want to plant it in no sorry this is not how you do it you don't know your tutu big bachcha hai the and he didn't say he was a buddha but he said he told me tu to bachcha hai to who are you to tell, kind of tell me what i am trying to do he didn't say that but in those many words but uh, that's how we went for me i i was in a new place in a new in a new time i stepped back i said okay i'm not going i can't push something down this elderly man's uh, throat or in his head he may be an employee but i'm also an employee as well and we'll, we'll see how i can kind of work with him and kind of get it done the first plot was all in lines but slowly over time chatting with him and kind of show him pictures or whatever we didn't have i didn't have a laptop, a laptop or computer or even a mobile phone then but through books uh, pouring over them or kind of looking at pictures and showing them i was able to kind of transform his thinking and saying look this is something else that we can do and then he got once he got the idea there was no turning back we were traveling by motorcycle we even once took a taxi also went through most, most of south andaman to look for species to look for plants and what what and plant to them but the benefits that came out through all of that was uh, they also realized yes this is going to be able to hold the soil much better uh, and so on and uh, it's going to be, it's much cooler we had king cobras coming into the into the uh, station we had a whole range of other uh, birds coming in and what not amazing to see beautiful to see i could see rats fighting in the trees at night and sometimes in the kitchen walking back to the hut i could hear the ki 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 and the two three rats squabbling on top of a branch of a tree and regular jungle rats but it's nice to see <laughs> they're in their own environment kind of doing what they're doing and so i i never envisaged or kind of thought i would be able to see it in that sense over a period of time i just have to be there and um, continue being this guy i was able to witness its growth as well so yeah that is good <laughs> yeah and even with the nipa i think uh, uh, more important let me this is again with the other form of of restoration in in a sense of uh, doing the planting that we were doing we did plant other trees as well local guys wanted um, but the nipa was a focus and there was a driver for it and the driver was, was the need of pressing or impressing upon them look some of you are really in in need of wanting this palm back because you you don't have to buy tin sheet you don't have to raise money to buy tin sheet you can always harvest it from your own backyard and this is how all of you lived before i'm not saying you have to go back to kind of living a, a primitive or, or a, a scraping through jungle existence etc but it's it's got a sense of comfort it's got it and people are talking about conducting uh, rituals and ceremonies under the roof of a nipa house in the in so the house which had a nipa thatch rather than, rather than a tin sheet and there are so many stories and anecdotes that one can kind of pull out with the contrast between the new and the old housing um but i think it is so important actually uh in fact if i i was talking to you about the tsunami and the uh that's an entire restoration effort as well of uh, trying to get people back on their feet we all have sense of comfort and a sense of familiarity both of you are in in your non native places and um away from home so you're always trying to do something that kind of makes you find your own sense of comfort either through food 
or the way your bed is or the way you would like to lie down and read a book or sit up and read a book or whatever it is so it's again finding that sense of comfort and in in that i i, I was i was privileged i would to say to be able to kind of uh, learn of this through some of the elders in the in lift maker bar singh we don't have i was always hearing this what i would refer to as complaints they were not complaints they were actually were lament saying okay this is not there how can we do this if we don't have that how can we do this i mean how can we kind of carry on doing this we don't have coconut trees how are we going to feed our pigs how are we going to feed the chicken how are we going to uh, get nipa back again for how are we going to what are we going to roof our houses with so all of these were very genuine questions and and kind of questions of of a future livelihood for themselves or life for themselves on their on their own island without those resources so how are we going to restore those resources and what what of that process entail and despite the fact that we dr avishankar and i proffered this advice and uh, ideas and suggestions to the government of india through uh, a report it wasn't accepted because it didn't involve contracts that were going to come through with the uh, companies building it and so on and so forth we were what we were suggesting was that local people build their own houses you provide them the material and when even the local community themselves heard of the choice that was available of of uh then you could just sit, sit back on your uh, in your tin shacks and wait for one or two or three four years and uh, the sarkar would build you a house of course it was the first choice go ahead please build me my house so and i really don't care what it is but once it once they actually moved in then they kind of figured out a whole set of issues with it some people didn't have issues they modified it they adapted to it and some very nice adaptations have actually happened uh, beautiful adaptations in fact in some in some instances but again it's, it's with people it's mostly with people who ac- have access to uh, monetary sources who can buy and add put in those additions uh, a lot of them don't have that so that's where you kind know of, uh, our idea of you kind know of putting in efforts of bringing in uh, or restoring the sources that are going to be helpful for them in, in the future without having the need to generate money to kind of access those resources getting back to those old systems of of ownership and of of uh, uh, control which their elders had the elders of the guys who would say yeah you can cut from here you can cut, don't cut from here and so on and so forth it's a beautiful system which i can have to run it through in detail if i can go through it uh, at, at some point of time but of how of how people take owners of responsibility over creeks and providing access to their own community members to uh, either cut or harvest nipa palm or not harvest it at a particular point of time but anyway so i mean i i learned a lot through that entire process and uh, that i mean i don't know if i've answered your question well akshay but um, uh, the restoration process was i looked at it from this lens of saying we were doing it in terms of cre- recreating that sense of comfort and a sense of reality and in that process we were able to restore or use in 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 these two cases species of trees or 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 a particular palm to restore or help bring about the sense of 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 comfort and a sense of kind of home to uh, that community no that more than answers the question and thank you for that manish because what you what you also illustrated is just uh, so nicely through your examples and through your positioning of what you consider restoration which is in some some sense uh, devoid of the hypocrisy that some some of us including myself who look at ecological restoration have so yeah thank you for that no but i think also the same times here actually um uh, the 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 what you refer to as the hypocrisy of uh, restoration that you're talking about it has its own place as well i wouldn't take that away it has it it, it definitely has its own space science has its space you you know that you you you, you that's where you work and you have worked and it it has its own space it has its own uh, time and it plays a very crucial role of, of bringing about understanding of what and how to go about uh, doing it doing uh, planting the other side is this of what i'm talking about of, of involving when you're involving local communities or uh, uh, in being able to find a sense of space or, or place and and taking on as a responsibility for it that's very important i think because as you all all of us know uh, the plantations of the sarkar or whoever does of saying we're going to green a particular place by planting tens of thousands of trees or even 500 or even five trees but no one owns it no one no one has account no one is accountable no one is responsible for the future of those of those those spaces or whatever it's important to have that to create the sense of of ownership and responsibility and account whether it's trees or whatever else you're trying to kind of recreate or restore i think it's it's so paramount importance of 
having that. In fact, in, at, in Wandur, which is a kind of a more of a kind of open access or a public uh, resource for us, at least at Anet, I didn't, I don't own that space. I don't own those trees. But the people I worked with and I did work with were there. Uh, we all had a sense of ownership over them, saying because after point after point when we had bamboo growing, we had villagers coming and asking us, "Bhaiya, can I have some bamboo from you?" I said, "Why don't you plant it yourself, yeah?" So I've given seeds to people of that melacona also, which, which we got from uh, Pobla. I've given seeds to come some of the local people. I don't know if it's grown or not, but give them. You plant it yourself. You so said you can have it uh, later. You don't have to come and begging for. I mean, ask asking it if, if for us from here. You can cut your supari or find your long bamboos to cut to bring down supari from your own household. And you should have a bamboo grove in your uh, lands. If you have five acres of land or even three acres of land, make one small corner for a bamboo grove and so on. And then also the sense of responsibility and accountability that the other staff also had over the uh, uh, resources. Because it, it was collectively ours in a sense. And when you had the have the privilege of saying, yes, you can take it, no, you can't take it too somebody from the outside coming and asking for uh, a resource such as bamboo or even timber sometimes. Yeah, thanks, Manish, for that. I think, uh, you know, that's a very nice, uh, well-rounded perspective for how much actually goes into something like this. And uh, also, I think indirectly, you pointed out a lot of the consequences of doing it uh, indiscriminately or, you know, without just in a two-dimensional manner, just to go plant a bunch of trees or something like that without really right. thinking about the other aspects. So that was really great. Thank you so much for sharing these incredible tales with us, Manish. Uh, as always, <laughs> when talking with you, it feels like we've only just scraped the surface of so this. All there is to understand and uh, learn from you. Um, see you again in the next episode. Thank you both, both of you, so much for your all your time as well and your listening ears. Um, yeah. Thanks for tuning in to episode two of our three-part series on the Andaman and Nicobar Islands with the Biodiversity Collaborator. While today's episode was originally titled Livelihoods and Adaptability, we ended up having a lot of fun running wild with Manish's several stories from his time in the islands. In our next and last episode of the series, Madhuri and Shiva will join Manish to discuss the future of people and nature in the Andaman and Nicobar Islands and what that will look like in the face of enormous development and conservation challenges that confront the region today and in the near future. See you next time.